In this video, I'm going to be discussing the top five things I like to do to prepare for a psychedelic experience. Number one, no list would be complete without set and setting. So set is the mindset. It is the state of mind that you have going into the experience. This is a collection of different attributes. You know, are you anxious? Are you depressed? What movies have you watched recently? What people have you hung out with recently? You know, what, what are your feeds on Facebook and Instagram? It's all programming on the subconscious level. How well have you been eating? Are you getting enough time in nature? Are you getting enough sunlight? Enough fresh air? These are all factors that play in how the mind operates. Do you meditate? Have you done the work to calm the mind? When a psychedelic is consumed, all bets are off, meaning there is always a possibility that you are going to unlock certain traumas that you may have not intentionally been seeking out. Instead of just letting go, the mind clings to pain as it identifies with those energetic patterns. Your mindset is a big player in the game of letting go. Another factor that would fall under set would be if you have done the sufficient amount of research before consuming the substance. If you're planning to go deep, you may be faced with a choice to let go and it will be disguised as you thinking that you are going to die. The mind can run away with stories like you took too much or you took the wrong substance. The more preparation you can do beforehand, the less of a chance that the ego is going to make a side quest out of the experience. You may find yourself worrying on a substance that you took too much and that you may overdose when it's simply the ego saying, hey, look at this scenario. Let's keep you distracted for a while. So preparation is key. Get a scale, weigh your substance, do your research and test your product. The less time spent worrying about avoidable problems on a medicine, the more work you can actually do. Now the other side of the coin is setting. Setting is just simply your surrounding. It is where you are and who you're with. Is it daytime or nighttime? Are you at home in your bedroom with the phone turned off? Or are you at a festival or a rave? Maybe you're in the desert or a forest for ceremony. The main thing here, if you are going to do it with other people, is to surround yourself with people that have your best interest at heart and people that you're comfortable and confident in being around. Have water available and food available to eat afterwards. What music are you going to listen to? I find it beneficial to pick a playlist beforehand and stick to it. The ego likes to control the situation. One way that it will do this is to make you get up and change the lighting or change the music or go do something else entirely. It's up to you to be on alert. Number two, breathing. I personally like Wim Hof breathing. Playing around with it, I've had some very entertaining visuals. Combine that with, I've also found my hands to come up in bilateral symmetry, just like when I'm on a full release dose of 5-MeO-DMT. I do it every time I do medicine now. There were times in the past where I've convinced myself for whatever reason to skip the breathing, but I can see now that the ego was playing tricks and I fell for those tricks. Breathing is incredibly beneficial. It consists of three rounds. Each round is 30 inhalations. I take a big breath in to 100% lung capacity, then gently release down to about 50 to 75%. And I repeat this for 30 inhalations. On the 30th breath, I release 100% of the oxygen and hold for as long as I can comfortably hold it. When I finally inhale, I inhale to 100% and hold for 15 seconds before starting the next round. What I find most interesting about this is usually by the end of the second round, my hands will come up and do mere movements like on 5-MeO-DMT. It's the strangest thing. There is definitely a change in consciousness doing the breathing. I'm not sure if 5-MeO-DMT is being produced and the body is moving because of that or the ego is breaking down due to the increased oxygen to the brain and the body is moving on its own as I move toward a non-dual experience. I do find I'm having releasing during the breathing as well. Coughing and yawning happens while doing the breathing. If this happens, just get right back to it. You know, this breathing is a great tool in the toolbox. It's relatively quick and painless to do. Number three, time. Give yourself enough time before and after the experience. Allow yourself time to ease into the experience. There is no race. Our frantic lives always needing to do the next thing takes us out of what we are currently doing. Just slow down and stop and breathe. 
I always enjoy cleaning the house and having a shower before doing medicine. Both of these activities are like a meditation to me. I remember one time back when I was doing one round of five MEO at a time, I had an hour to kill before I needed to go to soccer. So I just got the idea, you know, I could fit in a quick five MEO session before I go. And that's just what I did. I did my medicine, made it to the game, no problem. And then I started playing about 10 minutes into the game. This was the first time that I had a reactivation. Reactivation is basically experiencing the medicine again when you're not on medicine. So what happened was I was on the field, I had the ball and everybody was calling my name. It was coming from every corner, Josh, 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 Josh. And just hearing my name and as the energy within me was changing, it was incredibly difficult. You know, I had the ball, but I, I couldn't do anything. It was like I was having a mini panic attack inside. Um, luckily, you know, I was playing indoor, so changes on the fly, much like hockey. So I just went off and kind of collected myself in the corner. But if I had just given myself adequate amount of time after the experience, I would have been in a much safer environment to have that experience or that reactivation may not even have occurred. So it's important to give yourself both time beforehand and after your experience. If you can take the rest of the day to integrate, take it. Even if you can take the next day, take that as well. Number four, have zero expectations. This one is really easy to overlook, but incredibly important. In today's day, you could do two clicks from where you are right now and be hearing about someone's fantastical experience that they had on DMT with aliens and lizards preaching and promising eternal love. It's hard to hear someone's incredible experience as they come back to the community with a story to share in hopes that someone else can feel a glimpse of what they experienced and not want that for ourselves. It's up to us to not to attach to these stories and want them for our own experience. Every experience you have is unique to you, no matter how traumatizing or how enlightening, it is yours and yours alone. When I was in Peru, I had the most amazing experience on ayahuasca. It was my first ceremony, and then after I went and sat in isolation for five days in the forest, when it came time to do ayahuasca again, I was ready. I was so excited. This is going to be incredible. I could feel it. But then when the experience happened, it was a dud. My expectation killed the experience. This also leads me to setting an intention. Now, we may think we know what's right for us. You know, it would be pretty naive of me to think that I know what's best for me when working with these medicines. You know, there is a universal intelligence at play here. You know, this has to happen in a sequence, a series of healings. And for me to think that I know what's best for me is simply an illusion of the ego. If you still feel it necessary to set an intention, simply set it at, give me the maximum amount of healing that I can possibly endure. And with that, enjoy the experience. But that's how I like to go about it. And number five, okay, number five is symmetry. This is not only a tool that can be used prior to taking psychedelics, but also after taking psychedelics and while on psychedelics. You know, symmetry is gold. It is everything when it comes to this work. If someone is telling you that symmetry is not needed, they just don't know what they're talking about. Symmetry is even more important than the substance itself. Working in bilateral symmetry is the key to freeing yourself from your illusionary state of consciousness. Thinking you are a separate being from everything else is the reason why you are doing this work. Remaining in bilateral symmetry as long as possible while on the medicine is key. If you catch yourself breaking symmetry, bring yourself back to symmetry and relax. The ego likes to engage in asymmetries, meaning it will break symmetry to engage the pattern. If you can fight the discomfort and remain symmetrical, the pattern can be overcome and released. Doing these movements sober was actually the first time I was able to notice while sober that I have an ego. I am not the ego. At first, the movements were a bit rough. They feel almost like they were work, but over time, it got smoother and smoother feeling into the flow of energy and how it moves. I, I use these movements to clear stuck energy as well. If I feel a block in my chest, I will do these movements, usually standing up, and within seconds, I'll start coughing and clearing it out. These movements happen while on the medicine, when the ego is no longer present. No resistance, no effort, just happening. So, there you have it. My top five things I like to do to prepare for my psychedelic experiences. If you have anything that you like to do that helps with your sessions, please leave it in the comments below. 
so we can all help each other. And I like that quote from Ram Das: we're all walking each other home. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to leave a like, subscribe for more psychedelic related content, and I will see you on the next one.